Our friend Dolphus Ramser was born and raised in Concord, North Carolina, a town so rich with history that it provided the inspiration for its independent record label and management company. So great was the city's influence on Ramser that he continues to live and work in Concord today with full-time staff located in both North Carolina and California. He and his team always put their clients' music first, work as hard as they can, and have fun along the way. Visit Ramser.com to learn more. Welcome to The Road to Now, where we look to the past and everything in between to understand the present. I'm Bob Crawford. And I'm Ben Sawyer, and it's great to be back. We're very excited about season two. Ben, how are we beginning season two? Well, Bob, we're beginning season two with a series looking at the energy industry, which has been fascinating. And this first episode features Chuck Keeney, professor of history at West Virginia University. He was featured in the recent Nat Geo documentary, From the Ashes, about coal in America. Which is outstanding. At our house, we watched it when it premiered on Nat Geo and blew my mind. My, uh, Mike Bonfiglio is, did such an incredible job directing that and the interviews you got to watch that documentary. You will walk away smarter. Yeah, and, and it really, uh, uh, our interview with Chuck focuses on coal's impact in West Virginia. Right, and it's it's amazing because history is, is a tool of power. You kind of know that, I think. The more you study it, the more you realize that. And just the different ways that the coal industry has rewritten the version of, of coal that we know and understand now in very clear ways in a very short period of time. It is a, it is a great uh, exercise in understanding how that power works. And Chuck, did it, he just killed it with, with pointing that out. And he himself is part of the history of coal. His, his grandparents were part of the coal wars in or the early 20th century in West Virginia. And that is a very different relationship between the coal miners and the coal companies than what we understand today. Yeah, Chuck is is the perfect road to now guest. His personal family narrative fits in with the larger historical nar narrative of coal in West Virginia. Here's Chuck Keeney. We hope you enjoy the interview. Chuck Keeney, welcome to The Road to Now. Thank you for having me. Professor Keeney, you are a native of West Virginia. You're featured in the new National Geographic documentary, From the Ashes, which is about coal in America. Right. Can you tell us when coal was first discovered in your state and how did it come to dominate the economy? Oh, well, it was first discovered as early as the 1700s in what is now West Virginia, but it didn't become a significant engine behind the economy until the 1890s and first decade of the 20th century. So it, it was around for about 100 years before it, it became the, the big economic engine that we know of today. Uh, so the, one of the big misconceptions, even among West Virginians today, is that coal has always been a part of the regional identity, and that's really not the case. There was a long history before coal, so, so the region itself wasn't always attached. Unfortunately, a lot of people kind of believe that about the region. So, so what was the regional identity before coal? Well, it, it was more of a, uh, to, for lack of a better term, mountaineer kind of uh, identity. One of the things I like to point out in, in my college courses, particularly when I'm teaching West Virginia history, is that actually if you go back before the Civil War, you find that Western Virginia, which is what it was before the Civil War, Western Virginia actually had a much more diverse economy, a much more forward-looking economy than Eastern Virginia, which was this uh, plantation-based slave economy. And in Western Virginia, you had actually a much more forward-looking economic system with iron, clay, brick-making, glass, of various types of livestock industries. Uh, so you had a much more diverse economy with more forward-looking economy before that. And it wasn't this economy that, that was based upon industrial extraction. I think it's always mind-blowing to people in my class when I tell them West Virginia becomes its own state because of that economic diversion, because of the lack of interest in slavery during the Civil War. It becomes a state in 1863. That's correct. So then where was coal big for lack of a better word, before West Virginia, and how did they make the discovery that West Virginia was so rich in coal? First of all, I mean, when you, if you want to go back to you know the, the whole history of coal, England is really the, the first primary mover 
of coal. Uh, that's the first country that really pushes coal uh, as an energy source. And, and coal as an energy source goes back in England all the way to the Middle Ages, although it was used primarily then for heating homes. There was one English king, I believe Richard III. It was either Richard III or Edward III. I'm pretty sure it was it Richard that banned coal, the burning of coal in London during his reign because it was too sooty. But in Pennsylvania, uh, anthracite coal outside of Philadelphia, I believe, were some of the first coal mines. And also in western Pennsylvania, before it goes down to, uh, to West Virginia, some uh, coal mining that came out of West, uh, western Pennsylvania helped power some of the locomotives during the Civil War for the Union Army and helped bring supplies back and forth. So it's with the Industrial Revolution uh, that it really kicks off in a big way. And uh, I guess to answer your question about West Virginia is it's the 1880s where U.S. geologic surveys begin going through the region and begin finding these massive coal reserves. In fact, one of the very famous incidents of Appalachian history is the Hatfield and McCoy feud. And what a lot of people don't realize about that feud is that Devilance Hatfield owned 5,000 acres of land. People wanted that land because they found enormous coal reserves underneath it the land that he owned, and that was one of the big drivers of violence in that feud, was to get the Hatfields off the land so, so that they could get to the coal underneath. Wow. And, and how, how did they manage to do that? Oh, uh, drive the Hatfields off the land? Right, yeah, because it sounds like, usually when we think about that, it's like a feud between two families, but you're saying this is a much more complex story that involves uh, other interests. Yeah, yeah, it is. Terry Klein, uh, who was related to the McCoys, was one of the big drivers behind uh, the feud and behind the animosity. If you actually look at many of the, shall we say, uh, family conflict, you actually only have some incidents that happened several years apart that really aren't even all that much connected. But when Perry Klein, who lost a lawsuit to Devil Ann Tatfield, after that, he lost this lawsuit to this disputed land, then they found that there was enormous coal reserves. And he began trying to trump up some incidents that took place between the families, get the national media involved, and try to discredit Hatfields and then hire out bounty hunters to go after the Hatfields and eventually, there was enough violence that uh, the Devil Ants Hatfield sold his land and moved to neighboring Logan County. And uh, the town of Matemon now sits where Devil Ants owned his land. So it became a, uh, a small railroad town uh, for, the, for shipping coal. Yeah, you bring up Matemon, which brings us to a very interesting series of events in the 20th century there. The way that we imagine the alliance between coal companies and coal workers now, you know, they're just trying to help people keep their jobs. This is not at all the origins of the relationship between uh, between mine workers and the companies that own the mines. That's correct. You go back to the original union leaders, like my great-grandfather, for example, uh, Frank Keeney, who was president uh, of the miners' uh, union, UUMWA in West Virginia, one of the big leaders in the Pink Creek, Cabin Creek strike. Those guys, it, they, they wouldn't be caught dead with a Friends of Coal bumper sticker. That would have just been inconceivable to them. To them, the company's interest and the miner's interest were not one and the same. But that began to change in the 90s. And what, and what drove those attitudes to, to change? Okay. Well, you know, I've, I've talked a lot about this recently because I've gotten a lot of calls about, you know, of Trump and uh, the appeal of Trump. And I've done a lot of talks and about this uh, within the media over the last few months because of this kind of phenomenon. But really, it goes back to the 90s, really. Uh, first of all, you have in the mid-80s and early 90s, the UNWA was finally broken uh, in West Virginia, and largely uh, on a national scale, through uh, 1984, 1985 strike, and also in later in the Pittston strike and a couple of early strikes in 1991, 1992. This was largely because of Don Blankenship. He went on this enormous campaign to try to destroy the union, and he was very open about it. He was very open about trying to break the union. They would go in, they would buy up a union mine, they would close it down, and then they would reopen it six months later at a non-union mine, and, and then only hire non-union workers. Well, this led to huge strikes. Ultimately, the state government and the state police came down on the side of the coal companies, which is kind of a common theme in West Virginia history. The union was broken. When the union was broken in the late 80s, early 90s, you have to understand that they were kind of the counterbalance to the voice of the industry in the media, in the, in the culture, 
they kind of they were always there as a counterweight. When the UMWA lost that influence, they there was no real counter voice to that. Now, eventually, you do get a bargaining environmental movement in, in Appalachia, but uh, the the environmental movement has never had the clout that the UMWA had in its heyday. Because of that, the coal industry has been able to really aggressively step up their propaganda efforts. This was in the 90s. For example, you can look this up on YouTube. Uh, I recommend that you do. They, they had this video, I saw it in high school, called The Greening of Planet Earth. And this went around to all the high schools in central Appalachia. And it was about global warming, and it was saying global warming is happening, but it's going to be a good thing, it's going to help agriculture. It's going to be great. This was brought into the two science classes where I went to high school and all throughout central Appalachia. That's just one example. But they went on a major propaganda campaign to uh, go against environmentalism, to go against unionism, and that's when the Friends of Coal campaign began, Coal in the Classroom campaign, many of these other campaigns which started in the 90s, which helped bring working class people old from blue to red, politically speaking. So it was the 2000 election that, that did that. That was the election uh, with Al Gore and Bush. And that election where West Virginia switched, that, that changed the election because Gore lost by less than five points. And West Virginia's five electoral points made the difference in that presidential election. So the blue-collar shift is actually kind of old news. It just seems that now the media is paying attention to it. And that shift that began maybe in West Virginia and Kentucky has now, as we saw with the 2016 election, moved up into Ohio, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan. In March of 2016, Hillary Clinton campaigned in Columbus, Ohio, and she said, we're going to put a lot of coal miners and coal companies out of business. That was perhaps factor in her losing the election to Donald Trump. But as the From the Ashes documentary, which you are featured in, points out that it's not regulation or politicians who are putting coal miners out of, out of work. It's new technologies and natural gas. And it's really natural gas that's killing coal. Is that true? Yes, it's a changing economy. I mean, the economy is quite simply changing in places that are relying on older types of economies, like this coal model that we have here in Appalachia, are getting left behind. It's not as though we didn't see this coming. So many different factors play into that. We look at Hillary Clinton's comment that was played all over the, the media here. And it, people are just now coming around to the fact that we have to change. And as I was trying to say earlier in the interview from, from the address, I was pointing out that economic diversification away from coal is a conversation we should have had 30 years ago, not a conversation that we should just be beginning to have. I mean, as, as early as the mid-80s, the population of coal miners had you know, diminished from 100,000 in the middle part of the century to 30,000 by the mid-80s in West Virginia. So we'd already lost 70,000 jobs regionally, and that's just in coal mining. That's not all the, the jobs that come from small businesses and things that you know are related to the industry. So, I mean, it's been happening for a long time. We knew that this day was coming, but because the industry wants to keep up their profits for as long as possible because they control the politicians and the media in the region, uh, they've been able to perpetuate this myth that, you know, somehow you can bring back the coal glory days. Not that there ever was any glory days. Well, yeah, that, that's something I wanted to ask you about because it's also pointed out in the documentary that mine mechanization began in 1948 and since from 1948 until present day as as the technology of mining improved and advanced, the production increased, and with that corresponding to the increase in production was a dramatic decline in employment, in coal mining employment. Currently, approximately 54,000 coal miner jobs in the United States. That doesn't sound like a whole lot to me. Right. You know, in West Virginia, the number one employer is Walmart, and they have been for several years now. So this idea that we have to keep coal miners working in order to keep our economy moving is completely blown out of proportion. It's really sad because you could create more jobs in West Virginia with solar power on mountaintop removal sites 
than uh, you could by reviving the coal industry, and nobody would die from black lung. It seems like a no-brainer to me. Then how do you think that coal has captured America's imagination? As you point out, you're talking about 30,000 jobs. How is it that, that this has, because obviously it's, it's, it's the key point, you know, when Donald Trump announced the, his decision to bail out of the, the Paris Climate Accords, he talked about coal miners a lot. Why do we as Americans care so much about this industry? It's a very good question, and I'm not sure that I have a complete answer for you. I, I guess that I can say there's some kind of glorification of the perhaps blue-collar heyday of American manufacturing and industrial production. You know, in the late 1890s, early 1900s, we overtook all other countries in the world as far as our economy and uh, our industrial blue-collar, you know, that kind of tradition really sprang up quickly, but it became a very dominant part of American life. And I think some of this, is not just with coal miners, but also, you know, say manufacturing jobs in what is now called the Rust Belt, this notion that, you know, we had this enormously successful manufacturing blue-collar industrial past and somehow we can get back to it. it, it it's, a, it's a very interesting fascination that we have with it, uh, almost a romanticization uh, of it. <laughs> it. It's quite interesting. It's quite fascinating, really. It makes sense when you say it like that because then it's bound up in this imagined past evoked by the 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 campaign slogan make america great again right turn back the clock chuck you have an upcoming uh journal article in the historical journal of west virginia yeah it's called west virginia history a journal of regional studies yes i love how you begin it and it it's a, a credit to you as a historian you write history as it is interpreted in its varied forms of public memory can be presented as a carefully crafted self-portrait of, of a society some portraits are intended to broaden understanding, while others are intended to shape it. In public memory, the truth about our past is either illuminated or ignored, exaggerated or politically crafted, deemed significant or irrelevant. You go on to say, after Washington won at Yorktown, we want our freedom, but our liberty was still to be debated in the, at the Constitutional Convention. It seems like this coal issue is just another, like in America, this is how we do it. Everything from our founding in so many ways is a polarizing issue, and there are always two sides to each debate. Yeah, there are. And, and it's amazing how history can be twisted uh, for political purposes, even in, in a place like the United States. One of the things I write about in, in the article and in, in the book that I'm trying to finish this summer on the Blair Mountain Preservation Movement is this notion of, well, let's say when I was in the seventh grade, for example, the Cold War was still going on, and I was taking a, a social sciences class, and our teacher was talking about how the false history that students were taught in Russia. In Russia, they were told, students were told that there were Russian, there was a Russian that invented the telephone, there was a Russian that invented the steamship, so on and so forth. And we kind of laughed at that, and then the very next year I took West Virginia uh, history course, and there was no Blair Mountain, there was no Hawk's Nest disaster, there was no mine wars. Uh, we were also told that the first battle of the American Revolution took place in West Virginia. And these are events that, that are, are, are not even, some of which are not even a century old, uh, and yet they've been covered up so quickly. It demonstrates to us the significance of, of understanding our past in order to be able to have some clarity for political discussions in the present. But it also shows that if you just omit a few things, you can really, really shape people's perception uh, of what they see in, in current political discourse. It's just amazing. People don't know all the awful things that the coal industry has done, and so they're more likely to believe this line that the coal industry has provided the only means of economic prosperity that we've had, when in fact the coal industry has prohibited economic diversification and economic expansion in the region. Yes, I always say uh, in my classes that they have to remember that sometimes the silence is more powerful than the noise, and, and what, what we forget is just and sometimes more powerful than what we remember. You are listening to Season 2 of The Road to Now. Help us out by visiting Apple Podcasts and leave us a five-star rating.
Well, can, can we talk for a minute ab- about coal as a source of energy? It, it's, uh, I'm doing more research about this, but I mean, Thomas Edison invented the first coal-fired power plant, by the way. Uh, and it was in Manhattan, I believe, the very first coal-fired power plant, 1882, is when it was opened up. And Edison kind of developed the coal-fired power plant as a means of promoting his other new invention, the light bulb. And what we're finding out, or at least what I've been finding out by doing some reading and I have much more research on this to do, is it appears as though we didn't have to even go with coal to begin with. That there were, they were already originally cities were looking into alternative forms of electrical generation. But General Electric and several other big captains of industry saw how they could consolidate with, with, with big power plants. You could power entire cities with singular power plants, and that would enable to give them a monopoly over the electric industry. And they aggressively pushed out other types of electrical generation in order to gain that monopoly. So from the very beginning, there were alternatives to coal. There's this notion that coal built, you know, coal was responsible for the Industrial Revolution, and there's no doubt it played a crucial, pivotal role. There's no doubt about that. At the same time, it's been thought that coal was the only option we had uh, until recently, but that's really not necessarily the, the truth. Uh, now, it, it, um, coal is, of course, always going to be important as in steel production, metallurgic coal. As long as we're making steel, we're going to continue to need some forms of coal mining, but only about, say, 10 to 15 percent of the coal mining currently out of West Virginia is metallurgic coal. Then that number has gone up and down uh, over the course of years, but there's always going to be some market for that. And I, only think, I think the only thing that can ever revive coal in a significant amount is a third world war, which unfortunately may be more of a possibility than what we might like to admit right now. So, so speaking about the, you spoke earlier about the, the story, you know, what we don't hear and what we do hear. Could you tell us about the mine wars that took place in West Virginia in the early 20th century? Oh, yes. I can, I can talk mine wars all day. And, kind of the, and also the origins of the Union. Yeah, yes, several things. The United Mine Workers began in 1890 in Springfield, Illinois, but they didn't spread to West Virginia really until uh, the 1912, 1913 Pink Creek, Cabin Creek strike is when they really broke into West Virginia. And what happened, coal companies, railroad companies, and uh, other types of industrial companies from U.S. Steel, Standard Oil, even Rockefeller's company came in, and there was a big land grab in central Appalachia during this time period. Over 70% of the land in West Virginia currently is absentee owned, by the way. Uh, And it was even higher uh, during the industrial age. So you have outside corporations that came in and bought up huge portions of the land. And in most cases, kicking off native mountaineers. My family was among them. For example, my family moved into the region in 1751, and then they lost their land uh, to coal company. The people eventually rose up against this company town system, and they had this basically industrial police state known as the mine guard system, in which they had basically the private armies. For example, in Logan County, West Virginia, Sheriff Don Chafin had 300 deputies. Now, this is a county, uh, I think there are four, uh, in Logan County, West Virginia. Well, he had 300 uh, a century ago, and it was meant to keep the union out. They opened people's mail. They voted for you, by the way. In company towns uh, on election day, you went to the booth and your mine superintendent filled out your ballot for you. So you didn't have any freedom uh, to vote. You were paid in company money, not American money. And in some cases, company money was so uh, specified we have a, a, one of these in our Mine Wars Museum that I co-founded, Inmate One. It's a piece of script for one loaf of bread, meaning that the miner was paid, and the only thing they could get with the coin was a loaf of bread. So not only are they not getting paid in real money, but what they can buy is being dictated to them. So this is an un-American system, and miners unionized and rose up against that. And this was more of a spontaneous uprising by the miners themselves, and then the UMWA kind of piggybacked onto that, so to speak, uh, because union leaders weren't necessarily too enthusiastic about some of the local leaders, like my great-grandfather, who were very open to using violence and direct action uh, against the mine guards. 
So this led to a series of huge violent conflicts that went from 1912 all the way uh, into the 20s, culminated with the Battle of Bear Mountain in 1921, in which roughly around 10,000 coal miners formed an army. They controlled up to 500 square miles of territory. They marched from Charleston all the way down into the southern counties with the intent of, of forcefully ending the mine guard system. The coal companies put an army at Blair Mountain and on top of these ridge lines, basically to stop advancing miners' army. Actually, the setup was in, uh, very similar to the military setup of the Battle of Gettysburg. The kind of the coal companies on the ridge lines up on top and the miners down below. And it was fighting for four days. It was fighting along the 10 mile front. And uh, eventually the federal government came in. The miners surrendered to federal troops because many of them were World War I veterans and they didn't want to attack American soldiers. They had no problem killing coal company soldiers, but they didn't want to kill American military soldiers. They surrendered. There were treason trials which followed that. It, it stands as the largest challenge to industrial domination which took place in West Virginia, and that's why there's still such a controversy over the very site where the battle took place, because the coal companies want to destroy the site with mountaintop removal. Preservationists like me want to save it, and one of the reasons they want to destroy it is not, not for the coal, because there's really not a lot of coal there. Uh, they want to wipe out the history. They don't want to see a monument do a challenge to their authority. And I know this because I've sat across from the table. I've tried to negotiate deals with the West Virginia Coal Association, Natural, uh, uh, Natural Resource Partners, uh, Arch Coal, and Alpha Natural Resources. I've, I've actually tried to negotiate a deal to preserve the battlefield with them, and they don't want to see this history preserved, period. Where does the battle for preservation of the historic site stand as of today? We are waiting on a decision from the keeper of the National Register. We won a lawsuit last year. When I say we, the Friends of Blair Mountain, the uh, group that uh, I've been chair of for a number of years, and uh, the Sierra Club also worked with us, and a few other groups, uh, activist groups. We all went together on a lawsuit, and we won it last year in court. It was remanded back to the keeper of the National Register. The keeper has to make a new decision. It was briefly put on the National Register of Historic Places. Then the coal industry challenged that, led by Don Blankenship. They took it off the list. We challenged it in court. There was a bunch of other stuff that's gone on also, a lot of protests, a lot of activism, a lot of meetings, a few uh, state court things that my group has pressured them on. But long story short, the keeper is supposed to issue a new decision that should come in late July is what uh, the information that I'm getting. So we'll know a lot more then. Well, Don, Don Blankenship and Massey, they recently got into trouble, didn't they? Uh, a bit, well, that's nothing new. <laughs> it, it's kind of, I guess it depends upon your definition of trouble, because, you know, it's constant down here. They're always breaking the law, and they constantly get away with it. So people just kind of shrug their shoulders around here whenever they hear things like that. Well, th tell us a little bit about the congressional representatives uh, from West Virginia that are in Washington. We I think uh, Joe Manchin's probably the the more of a household name, uh, but but where do you know, what what is it all Republican Party rule there, or um, are there still some old school Democrats? Uh, is it changing at all? As I, as I said before, it's becoming more red since 2000. Joe Manchin, of course, is probably the most prominent, even though he's a Democrat, but he is uh, at best a, a kind of a FDR Democrat. You know, at, at at its very best. I mean, you'll never hear him use the word climate change. Um, you just won't, even though he's a Democrat. It, it doesn't, as far as the Democrats, it doesn't look good for the Democratic Party in West Virginia in, in the future, even though our governor is currently Democrat. He's also a co-operator who was a Republican and just switched over to the Democratic Party right before the election. With Manchin, even though he is a Democrat and he's a moderate, in some sense a moderate, he is never going to advance, say, environmental policies that the National Democratic Party advances. And the way it is, the way the political climate is today in West Virginia to mention climate change as a candidate is to commit political suicide uh, within the state. Which is amazing because you just said earlier that in the 90s they put out propaganda that said that there was climate change and that it was cool. Right, right. It was a good thing. It was going to help. It is such a beautiful state. 
I mean, with amazing people. We've been there. Uh, our band has been through there many times over the past 16 years. And uh, we, uh, we've always been embraced by the crowds there and the people there. Are there any industries, any new businesses that, that have been able to get a foothold uh, to help change the economy of West Virginia and to offer more opportunity for a more diverse population? Yeah. First of all, uh, yeah, it is, it is a cool place that, that does have a lot of cool people. And yes, it, it is very beautiful, you know, the places that haven't been touched. The natural gas industry is beginning to fill up the spaces where the coal industry is, is, is leaving. And I don't know that that's necessarily a good thing. I haven't studied fracking uh, perhaps as well as I should have, but basically the, the small amount I've read about it says that it could potentially damage water severely, cause earthquakes. There's a lot of serious environmental issues with that. Plus natural gas fracking jobs aren't long-term, but the natural gas industry is coming up in a big way, but largely because of the Marcellus Shell, which goes into portions of West Virginia. And there's another very, very huge natural gas deposit that's bigger than Marcellus that's in the southern portion of the state. So in some sense, we're, we're kind of switching out one extraction industry for another. You've seen a lot of crazy bills that have been put forth uh, in the state legislature in the last two years, one of which enabled gas companies to survey your property without your permission because of this notion of that we're desperate for jobs. They're willing to let the gas industry come in and do whatever they want just in order to create a few jobs. And it's difficult to get other types of businesses to come in because, you know, even though the state's very pretty, you know, do you want to come into a coal community where you're not sure if the water is healthy to drink, you're not sure about the air quality? There, there's a lot of things to deter outside businesses. There's a lot of work to do before we can really open the state up to a, a lot of new things. And people have to be really, really willing to let that happen. And unfortunately, I still think people are still clinging in that last bit, this imagined uh, economic glory that Cole once supposedly had. There, there's, a, there's a deep irony there in the fact that the, the, the standard line coming out of the coal industry is that it is government that is killing coal when, when, when you, know, you actually look back at it and in the past and in the present – Coal has used the government very effectively to push its agenda when that worked for worked out for coal. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, it's a really good point. They don't want government. When they say they don't want govern, government interference, what they mean is they don't want any kind of government interference that hurts them. They're perfectly willing to have government interference when it's to their advantage. They weren't worried about government interference, for example, at Blair Mountain when the federal government came in. They're not worried about government interference when they're breaking a strike. That's when government interference is great. But yes, you're exactly right. They've used government to their advantage in every way. And it kind of upsets me whenever you turn on Fox News and they say they talk about the carbon tax or subsidies for solar energy. And they say, well, you can't pick winners and losers. Well, that's what they did from the very beginning is picking the coal industry as a winner in that. Uh, you know, that's what established those industries, is by picking winners and losers early on. Is it possible that the coal industry will kind of die out on its own, I mean, just by attrition? I just think that eventually, for example, you didn't need to convince people to abandon horses once the automobile became available. Once things like, like for example, solar energy, when that becomes more affordable, when the, when the technology improves enough, when consumers have a choice, if you have a choice, if you can have cheap solar energy and you know that you have the potential to go off the grid, uh, you don't need power lines, those types of technology is better. Consumers are going to gravitate towards that when they become available. So I think it's only a matter of time. But the problem, of course, is that in places well, you know, like West Virginia, where the industry has such a dominance, they'll cling to it for so long that you know, when they leave, there has been no preparation for what comes next. And that's what the unfortunate thing that we're seeing now. Chuck, uh, how did you get interested in this topic? What, what led you to dedicate your life to studying coal and, and its history and the Appalachian and in particularly West Virginia region? <laughs> well, I actually did not intend to study coal. It was not my intent. As a kid, uh, I began hearing stories about my great-grandfather, Frank Keeney. 
the, in fact, the very first time I ever heard about him was at a family reunion. I was about maybe seven years old, eight years old, and I was out back uh, playing with a toy knife, one of these little toy plastic knives, trying to throw it into the side of the hill, you know, like they do in, in movies. <laughs> and uh, an older relative came up to me and said, oh, you need to learn how to throw that thing correctly. And I said, really? And he said, yeah, you know, you never know when a, a Baldwin felt mine guard might be after you. And I, of course, had no idea when I was a kid. And I'm like, what are you talking about? What's a mine guard? The guy uh, leaned down and said, don't you know who your family is? And, of course, I had no idea. And he begins to tell me about, you know, a little bit about the mine wars. I run to my dad, and my family really hadn't talked to me about that. And I began to hear stories uh, about Blair Mountain, about all of the different things that happened from my family members, not from the classroom. And then that began to, you know, when I went to the eighth grade to take my West Virginia history course that everybody has to take here, I went to my teacher and said, when are we going to cover the mine wars? What can you tell me about Frank Keeney? Well, she had no idea about the mine wars or Frank Keeney. And so that got me curious. Why did all this stuff happen? This really interesting, fascinating history with all this drama and excitement, and nobody's talking about it. That was the fundamental question that, that led me into it deeper and deeper. Through a series of circumstances, I ended up taking a job as I was finishing my doctoral work at West Virginia University, largely because I, it was just open, and I wasn't finished with my dissertation yet, and so I thought I would take it. So I go down there, and suddenly I'm in the midst of all this, right when the Blair Mountain controversy really started heating up, right when all this election stuff uh, you know, this huge political shift was happening, and, and I, it just kind of involuntarily immersed me into everything. And so it's kind of the culmination of, the, of, of a number of things. But it's a very personal uh, history to me, specifically with the mine wars and the struggle of resistance against the industry and my family's role in that that kind of has, you know, driven me to where I am. That's an f- amazing story, Chuck, and that's what the road to now is all about. It's how does that personal narrative fit in with the larger historical narrative? And you are a living example of that. And we're just so glad that you've decided to dedicate your life to telling that story, your family story, your state story. It's just, uh, you're a a really, from everything I've read and, and seen, uh, you've done a lot of documentaries and you are a great historian and a great asset to us all. Thanks so much for joining us today, Chuck. Thank you, Chuck. Well, yes, thank you so much for having me. I've I've really enjoyed uh, talking to you guys. Thank you for joining us today on The Road to Now. Our program is produced by Bob Crawford, Ben Sawyer, and Ian Scotta, edited by Bob Crawford and Ian Scotta. Paul DeFiglia provides our music. Please be sure to follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, and rate us on iTunes. For more information about this or any other episode, please visit theroadtonow.com. For Dr. Ben Sawyer, this is Bob Crawford. Take care.